Today I'm going to begin a mini-series of three on the kingdom. And my title today is A Passion for the Kingdom. And my goal is for Jesus to challenge us deeply as we start a new season this year. And I want to Jesus challenge to you, what is your life about? What is your life about right now? And we're going to, my first point is no more new, lukewarm. And then what does the kingdom of God actually mean? And then I want to talk about how we express a passion for the kingdom. So my first, the first thing I want to talk about is my, my title here, No More Lukewarm. You probably all know what lukewarm means. It's kind of tepid, neither hot or cold. Um, people like hot drinks or they like cold drinks, but people don't usually want a, a lukewarm drink. Like if I said, um, you know, would you like a cup of tea? Would you like a hot cup of tea or would you like iced tea? I'm not going to say, would you like kind of lukewarm tea? Look, what, tea that's kind of been sitting in the sun for a bit and kind of warmed up a bit or cooled down. No, lukewarm is not something that we, that we like usually in drinks. And it's become, in our language, to mean something that doesn't have much real commitment to it. And uh, we all know what Jesus thought of a church, the, the church of Laodicea in Revelation, where he said, you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either hot or cold. And so Jesus expressed dislike for this lukewarm. And a powerful quote that I read is, you were made to live with something worth dying for. You were made to live with so for something worth dying for. And I want to argue that we are living in an age that is screaming out for something real, that people are desperate for something real. How come that radical Islamists can recruit so rapidly, even in places like Canada, is because they actually believe in something. They, they demand everything. They demand complete sacrifice. And people intrinsically know that they're designed for something that requires that kind of commitment. I want to argue that um, buried in the human heart is a desire to devote ourselves totally to something that we believe in. And I want to, to challenge you that that's there in your heart as well. That passion, if you can get in touch with it, to completely commit yourself. Now, people uh, can commit themselves in many different ways to many different belief systems. And, um, and <clears throat> it's not, they're not necessarily bad things at all. I have a friend who's Jewish, and when his children were five, he sent them to Hebrew school on a Sunday to, leave, to learn Hebrew. Um, what would you think if, uh, if a Christian like, sent their five-year-olds to learn Greek? People might say, oh, it's a bit much, like making a five-year-old learn New Testament Greek. But, you know, is it? Is it? Should, surely we should admire commitment like that. Um, uh, I, I think that um, we, we should have a life where we're living with something to die for. Um, so, but paradoxically, we live in this, co uh, this comfort culture that's dedicated to insulating ourselves from the slightest discomfort. Everything must be nice and easy and comfortable, and that's our culture. And so I think we see uh, a divide between what I'm going to be talking about today and the culture of our, of our society. You know, when Moses went on the mountain and spent time with God, uh, when he came down, his face was shining. And if we had this kind of passion for the kingdom, there'd be something about us that would be radiant to the world, that people would know there was something different about us. Um, so I, this is what I want to, to, to argue. Um, 
the, the words of Jesus are a culture shock to us, I believe, in many ways. Um, I, I just, but there's, there's one more thing that I just want to say before I go on and talk more about, about what Jesus said. And that is, it's, it's not just enough to be passionate about something. It's not just enough to have a commitment. You've got to have a commitment to something that's true and something that's right. I'll tell you a story. Many of you who know me know that I love cats. And um, uh, in our neighborhood, there's quite a lot of people who have cats. And one day I was walking along and attached to the, a pole was a sign that says, um, Fluffy is lost in this picture of a cat. If you find Fluffy, please call this number. And most of my heart went out to these people. I know what it would be like to have your cat disappear. And I thought, oh, I'm going to keep my eyes out for Fluffy. So I had a good look at what it looked like. And uh, later that day, I saw a cat that looked very much like the picture uh, in front of someone's house, and then it disappeared. Anyway, the next day, I saw Fluffy across the street, looking very lost, walking up, meowing at doors. And I thought, I've got to do something here. So what? What am I going to do? It's, you can't just walk up to cats and pick them up if they don't know you. You probably know that. You've got to be very careful and planned out. So um, I, our daughter was with us, with us at that, that moment, and I, I said, could you help me here? We're going to do a plan here. So I went across to where the, the house where Fluffy was, and I, I knelt down on the ground, and I called, and, and this cat meowing came up to me, and quick as a flash, I grabbed her pulled her around between my knees and, and held her down so she couldn't, couldn't freak out. Well, she did freak out, and she just tried, just went crazy, tried to bite me, and um, actually her tooth caught my jeans, didn't get through to the flesh, but caught my jeans and just sliced my jeans down and my leg here. But uh, anyway, I managed to hold her and calm her down, and my daughter went and got her a big towel, and we gently wrapped her up in this towel and took her back and put her in our, our bathroom where she would be safe and couldn't get out, and uh, just let her be there for a moment. And I went out, went back to the sign on the pole, got the number, called them and said, we found Fluffy. And they said, oh, Fluffy returned yesterday. So you can imagine what I felt. I was very passionate about this, but I was wrong. So, um, well, we released Fluffy, and Fluffy went straight home. I followed her to see where she went, and she went straight home. And, uh, and um, it was somewhere different to where the sign was. And um, uh, for a while, every time I passed that bar, I'd see, when if I saw Fluffy outside, she'd look at me and just run. <laughs> So what's the point of that story? The point of that story is that, that it's, I'm speaking about passion here, but it's absolutely vital that our passion aligns with the truth, that we're passionate about something that is true. Otherwise, it's not just, um, it's not just waste. It's actually dangerous. So, that's, um, so moving on now to, to, to what Jesus taught. And Jesus was not lukewarm if he was anything but a lukewarm. And he lived for one thing. He said, my, my, my food is to do the will, the will of him who sent me. Uh, he spoke about the kingdom. I had a look in the, in the Gospels, and Jesus, uh, there's 124 times the word kingdom is used, and almost all of those are Jesus using the word himself. Um, he had a burning passion for the kingdom. He lived, ate, slept, and talked about the kingdom. It was pretty much all he spoke about, the chief concern of his life. And uh, when he began his ministry, Matthew 4.17 says, From that time, Jesus began to preach this message, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. So, um, the, word, the term is sometimes interchangeably kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God. It's the same thing that it means. So when he was preaching, and this is the verse we're going to concentrate on, the passage we're going to concentrate on today, uh, we're, though we're going to look at a couple of others in Matthew as well, but I want to look at Matthew 13. When he was preaching, he would say things like this. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up, then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. 
Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. He's a pearl merchant. This is what he knows. He looks for it. Who, on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Isn't that powerful? Isn't that a challenge? This is what Jesus is saying you need to do with your life. You need to sell everything for him, for his kingdom. Now, that doesn't mean to say that you, you sell all the possessions that you have, like various people have done, like C.T. Studd and, uh, and a few others have done in the past, but you effectively you're called to use all your resources for him, for his glory. And um, I'm going to look at Matthew 10 now, where Jesus talks a little bit about what the cost might be for this. Um, he says in Matthew 10, So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny me before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I've not come to bring peace but a sword. Hang on. We're not expecting Jesus to say that. We know ultimately he's bringing peace. But what is this? I've come to set a man against his father a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of their own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives me, you receives me. And whoever receives me, receives him who sent me. What is Jesus talking about? Is he saying that you're going to have fights in your family if you follow me? What he's saying is this, is you need to be prepared to. That might happen. My, my own father, when he was 19 years old, he became a Christian and his dad threw him out of the house. He had to take everything and just leave the house when he became a Christian at 19. That was the cost. He had to have a choice. Are you going to do that or not? And sometimes that is the cost. And Jesus says, you have to realize that if you're following me, there is going to be a cost. And uh, he describes taking up your cross and following him, which really means being prepared to, to suffer for the sake of, of the kingdom. And when he says, whoever loses their life for my sake will find it, he means those of us, if we're willing to to sacrifice everything that we have as being as less priority than, than Jesus, than the kingdom, then we're not worthy of him. This is a huge challenge. I mean, are we really up to this challenge this morning? Like, This is not the way that people live their lives here in Toronto in 2022. um, He says, anything that is competition for your kingdom in your life, you need to be prepared to leave behind. The kingdom must be your primary focus. So uh, what about the rest of life? Well, Matthew 6, which is the third passage I want to look at. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So the point here is not that if you, if you seek Jesus, you know, you'll, you'll lose everything else. It's that actually seeking him first, putting him first, his kingdom first. It turns out that all the other things find their place and God provides for you. So uh, it's very clear then that Jesus' teaching is this total commitment to following him, that it is above everything else in our life, every other joy, every other excitement, every other calling, every other relationship is about, um, is, must be underneath the calling for the kingdom, for following Jesus. Which raises the question, of course, what does the kingdom of God actually mean? 
what are you talking about here, Andrew? Like you're talking about this kingdom. What actually is this kingdom? What, what is it? And so that is something we are going to focus on that right now. And the first thing to say is the kingdom is not the same as the church. The kingdom is not the same as the church. There's a relationship, which I'll talk about in a minute, but it's not. <clears throat> um, you may have heard people say, in my life, I put, um, I put God first, and then my family relations second, and then church third. Well, and that's good. I mean, that's a good, that's a good uh, way people organize. And then my job fourth. You know, people organize themselves like that. But you wouldn't say, I put the kingdom third. No, the kingdom must be above everything. And so there's something that's different between the kingdom and church. And um, uh, what, what, what then is the kingdom if it's not church? Well, uh, I want to suggest to you that um, an, an equivalent word is to, to kingdom is new creation. Jesus actually never used the term new creation. And later on in, the, in, in Paul and the epistles, they rarely used the word kingdom. New creation was what they talked about, being new, being new in Christ. And, but they're pretty much equivalent to one another. And another way, a practical way of thinking of the word kingdom, simply kingdom has got the idea of rule and it primarily means God's rule. So if you wanted to sum up the kingdom in two words, God's rule is a very way, good way of doing that. So if we say that is our meaning, what does that actually entail? What does the, what's in fact does that actually look like? It looks like God's kingdom is righteousness, peace, justice, love, mercy, all of those things. And when God's rule comes into a situation, it brings those things into it. So when God's rule or God's kingdom comes into a marriage, then anger and selfishness get replaced by love and servanthood. Because those things are the character of God's kingdom, of God's rule. And so tangibly, what God's kingdom looks like in a situation are those characteristics of God. When God's kingdom comes into society, the poor get treated fairly. The oppressed are liberated. There is justice and fairness in society. This is what God's rule looks like when the kingdom comes into society. When God's kingdom comes into broken lives, people are set free emotionally. People are released from the, the pain of their broken hearts because that is what God's kingdom is about. And so God's kingdom then is about being a passionate for God's kingdom is about being passionate about bringing God's values and God's rule into every part of our lives every aspect of our lives. And of course, that is in opposition to Satan's kingdom, which is the kingdom of darkness, which is all about fear. It's all about injustice. It's all about oppression. It's all about these things that I don't need to go into detail because you see them in society all around us. And so primarily then, God's kingdom is about his rule being brought into every area of our lives. So what then does the kingdom look like right now? How is this seen? How is it visible? Well, I would say, just a, very briefly, a power and a people. So I would say the power in God's kingdom is a power to forgive, a power to overcome Satan, a power to heal, a power to to set free, and this results in a people who are forgiven, healed, and set free from the kingdom of darkness. And so the power, if the, if the people of God are moving in his power of his kingdom, then they are like a manifestation of what it looks like. So I would say then that, um, that uh, the church isn't the same as the kingdom, but it should be an expression of the kingdom to this world. 
So if we are living as we ought to, if we are filled with the kingdom, if we're passionate for the kingdom, then we should be a manifestation, a light of the kingdom to those around us in, in this world. Jesus talked about a city set on a hill, a light on a light stand, being light in the darkness. And so <clears throat> it's not the organizational structure of the church, which is kingdom, but the people should be how the kingdom gets taken to this world. And so what you're called to do then is to be a carrier of God's rule into this world. Part of that is by telling people about God. As Jesus told his disciples to, he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom. And he did, so that's part of it. And part of it is to embody the kingdom values in your life in every way. So you can't say you love the kingdom but don't care much for the church because the church is a tangible expression, or at least should be, of the kingdom. So this is only part one of my three-part series, so I'm going to be going into more of these things. So this is really just an introduction, but I would like to talk finally about how we, how you and I, can express a passion for the kingdom. How to express this passion. So I would say the first thing is, in practical terms, no compartments in our lives. You may have met people who do church on Sunday, but the rest of the week, who would have thought that they went to church? It's just a surprise. But um, that is what God is, call, is not calling us to, to do. He wants us to, to be involved in everything. And part of that is that prayer pervades all aspects of our life. We don't see anything that we're doing as secular. So even if you're at work or you're doing something mundane like shopping, none of it is secular because all of it is you're doing as part of the kingdom. Um, some of it might, of course, be more critical than others. You know, dealing with a, a difficult situation at work may be different to you know, buying milk at the store in terms of the intensity, but there are ultimately no compartments to our lives. And uh, prayer should pervade everything. And we must believe that actually God can, God can answer prayer um, in, in any way in our prayers supernaturally. Um, uh, but most of all, I want to say that it, de it depends, it, it, um, it has to do with what our priorities are. Uh, a quote I love, um, white eternity on our hearts that we would live by the age to come. That God would write eternity on our hearts that we would live by the age to come. When I was 17, I became a Christian. I was born again, came to know the Lord. And um, I was born in a, to a Christian home, and I kind of thought I was interested in becoming a Christian for years, but I really wasn't committed to it. And one night as I was praying, um, just, very, just, just the, the night that I became a Christian, I was praying, and I had this picture of the future. And the picture was a, a road. You know how these, like the road that goes off to infinity, where all the lines meet in infinity? It was a road like that. And it was going off to infinity. But what was shocking is there was a line across it just in front of me, a white line in the road. And that was the end of this life, like just a few feet away. And the rest of it was eternity. And I thought, wow. This is so unimportant compared with the rest of it. The only really important thing that, that I do in this bit of life is prepare for eternity. That's really the only important thing. And I, like it struck me so powerfully, really the only, the only thing I had to do was to, to, to make sure that I was trusting in Jesus. And that like hit me so hard and, that, and, and following after that, I, I, was, I was born again. Uh, but, you know, that still is true. And I, wanna, I want to just bring that home to you. This life is so short. Eternity is infinitely more longer than this life. This life is a few years. 
and you're going to spend the rest of it eternity. That should be in your hearts. Your focus should be on that, not on this. And if you're like me, so often we get caught up in stupid little things. Things that you think, well, why did I spend time on that? Like it was so ephemeral. It only lasted the short time. It's eternity that should be written on our hearts. So I would say then, um, uh, if, it's, if it means discomfort following Jesus, if it means people thinking we're a bit weird or not liking us or causing some division, what is that compared with the time of eternity? What's the time? What is that? So Jesus calls us then to suffer discomfort for such a short time and then to enter into eternity, enter into glory. And one last thing that I want to say, and uh, this is my last slide today, kingdom means warfare. Because of course there are two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of darkness as well as the kingdom of light. And um, uh, I want to suggest to you that most spiritual warfare is not very glamorous. Most spiritual warfare is simply saying no to temptation in our lives and fighting against what the Apostle Paul uh, calls the old man or the flesh or those old habits that we have that have been there since before we were saved that are the old ways of living that are self-centered basically and it's that war between the old and the new between the 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 kingdom in our own hearts and the temptations that Satan brings to us, uh, old ways of behaving, reactions, uh, how we treat people the way we always used to and not having that humility and that love that Jesus is calling us to in the kingdom. And this, I would say, is a key part of the kingdom. And uh, also, I would say, a faith and trusting God is part of this spiritual warfare. Don't forget, the first time there was spiritual warfare was in the garden, and Satan came to Adam and Eve and tempted them not to trust in the Lord, not to trust Lord for their provision. He doesn't really have your best interest in, at heart. He's trying to keep you away from what's really good for you. And that temptation is warfare. And so I want, to, I want to suggest to you that that temptation, no, I can't really trust God, his way, yeah, it would suck a bit if I was to go his way. And that is, that is the, one of the key ways that Satan comes in with warfare. Um, and I want to focus you on, as, we, as we're finishing now, I want to focus you on that parable that Jesus gave of the pearl of great price. Isn't Jesus worth selling all that you have? Isn't he worth, isn't he far better treasure than the stuff you see around you? And um, are you a follower of Jesus? Maybe you're here and you're not following Jesus. And Jesus says to you, you can, if you follow me, all you have to do is to trust me. Give me your life and I will give you the, 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 this pearl, which is of infinite value. I will take away all of your guilt. I will give you eternity What's the, what's the cost of that compared with a few moments of fake joy in this life? So I want to challenge you. Is Jesus the pearl of great price to you? When you see him, do you say, that is such an extraordinary value and, and, and treasure that I want to give everything for that, that person, that kingdom, that, it, that place to be with him in eternity. Is that, I want to challenge you. Are you, are you willing to do that? Because there's a cost. There's a cost is everything. And uh, I'm going to just pray now and I'm going to ask that God gives each one of us insights into what this cost is during this coming week. Because there is a cost, but the rewards from that vastly outweigh the cost. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this calling that Jesus gives us to, to sell everything for the pearl. And Lord, we pray that you would show each one of us in this coming week how we can be more passionate for you. What things that we are holding on to that we shouldn't hold on to. Where we should place our value. Show us, Lord, practically what changes we need to make. 
And Lord, we thank you that you promised that if we seek first your kingdom, everything else will come. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we commit ourselves to you. Lord, this, this task is too big for us. So Lord, we ask you to be with us in this task of giving us this passion. Set, set us on fire for you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.